welcome back to the In The Lab stage. This is our final session um, for today on this stage. And in this one, we're going to be talking all about foundation models. Um, for anyone who hasn't come across this term, the, the term foundation model was actually coined in the summer of 2021 to refer to large, broadly trained ML models that can be further trained to specialist applications. Foundation models, it seems, aim to shift the emphasis from the narrow but deep AI that we've been familiar with over the past decade to something that's more broad but shallow. Um, already, applications of foundation models are appearing, such as GitHub's uh, now famous, infamous, depending on uh, which, uh, what you're reading, co-pilot code generator. In this panel, we want to sift through the hype and understand the reality of a foundation models. Um, again, we're going to be using Slido, so please do send in all your questions. I've got them here in front of me, and I'd love to make sure I'm reflecting who's in the audience, so make sure you do send your comments as soon as we're also going to have some polls in this session, which is going to be a good bit of fun. But before we get on with things, let me introduce my esteemed panel. Um, welcome back, Michael Woolbridge, co-director of the AI programme here at the, the Turing Institute. Um, Angelique Lazaradou, who we've got joining us uh, virtually. Hi, um, Angelique. She is from uh, a staff research scientist at DeepMind. Uh, we've got Phil Blunsom. Phil's professor of computer science at the University of Oxford and also a senior research fellow of St. Hugh's College. And finally, Peter Flach. Peter is professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Bristol and is a Turing fellow. Um, what a brilliant panel here to talk all things foundation models. Um, we said we're going to start off the session with a poll from the audience. So if you go into Slido, you will see the first of the polls that we've got up for you, um, hopefully going live now, which is all about, are you excited by the possibilities of foundation models or do you think they're going to be a flash in the pan? So hopefully that poll is going to be live for you any second now so that people can start casting your votes and we'll have a little chat and come back to what the results are. Maybe we'll even ask it at the end of the panel as well and see if the results have changed. Um, so let's, uh, let's get chatting about these foundation models. I mean, what is the long-term potential for foundation models and for this new technology? And what are the limits? Um, let's start with you, Peter. Um, I think it's a bit too early to say. They have been very successful in natural language processing. Uh, and there is kind of a hope that they will extend to other kinds of data. And, uh, and there are many, many potential applications, but I think we, we need to see a bit more of them before we can know what they can really do. Okay, so you're a little bit, um, shall we say, holding yourself back with your not too overly hopeful just yet. Well, as you say, the, the term was only coined uh, a year ago. Yeah. less than a year ago, and it's, it's very much a debate. Uh, the, the name foundation model is also people, some people have objected to the term because it, it kind of suggests that it's the foundation of everything else. I don't think that that's how, how the authors uh, meant it. But, mm. um, so it, it's really a discussion, I think, more than, than, than achievement. Okay, well, we're clearly early in the discussion then, which is great to be having it here. Um, Phil, what are, what are your thoughts on kind of long-term potential of these, of these foundation models and this technology? Uh, well, the, the idea of foundation model is a very broad idea, so that in some sense the potential is the potential of AI. Um, if we can build uh, foundation models that understand language in the way a human does, then it has a, the, the same potential that that does for, for humans. Uh, the idea of foundation models very much uh, a bit of a return to the old modular view of intelligence that we can separate understanding language or vision from any particular task that we might do. Like uh, now we're having a conversation about foundation models that's separate from our each individual understanding of language. Um, that's sort of the idea of foundation models. We can build a big model that, that encapsulates some uh, knowledge um, that's fundamental to intelligence and then that can be used in lots of uh, tasks or, or, or um, applications, which is a bit of a change to the last few years where there's been a big focus on end-to-end -end learning, the idea that for any given task, uh, we want to go from input data to output task in one big model. Um, so foundation models are a bit, bit more of a return to the classic AI idea of mod modularity. Um, whether uh, modularity or end-to-end -end is a better way of looking at things is still, still open. Still up for debate. Um, let's bring um, yourself in, Angelica. What well, about you? What's your sort of feelings around this this technology, and perhaps uh, what are the sort of limits that you foresee um, in this idea, or is it indeed limitless and, and worthy of all its hype? No, I mean I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean I I don't think it's um, limitless, and 
I guess one of those things I see when I play with these models, like even on my own research, is this notion that they're they're very great at detecting patterns, but the moment that you know you want to do something that has a bit more reasoning, a bit of a more of a complex task, uh, perhaps not a task that they have seen exactly on the training data in the exact same way as the user frames it, then um, we see that these models struggle um, with producing the right answers. So yeah, basically the, the current way that we train them is nice, but they make them very brittle. Um, as, as Phil said, it's uh, um, there is a lot of like some shallow learning happening on like on the surface form. The ways, for example, that words go together and a, a bit of extrapolation beyond there. But uh, it's it's very difficult to have like real, the, the, you know, the type of reasoning that humans have and the type of processes that humans have, for example, when they solve a task, um, just in the way that we train them today. And that's perhaps okay, because um, we as humans, we come with like a lot of inductive biases. Um, on the other hand, these models don't have a lot of inductive biases, so there might be like a, a good synergy there for to, to overcome some of these limitations. Amazing. Thank you, Angelica. And of course, Michael, I'll come to you and get your sort of initial thoughts as well. Yeah, so it's interesting to hear Phil, who's a real expert on, on natural language processing, talk about, uh, talk about the way that these models embody uh, knowledge of language. But what's interesting for me is that if you look at, you know, the, the most famous of these models is, is, is probably GPT-3. And we don't know, it's a proprietary model, so we don't know exactly how it was trained. But the, the anecdote, the word on the street is that, roughly speaking, they threw the entire World Wide Web at it. And I think there's some statistic about uh, the, the, the entirety of Wikipedia. It was trained on the entirety of Wikipedia, which made up only about 5% or 10% or something like that of the total corpus that it was trained on. So vast amounts of data throwing at that. But in the end, I think what you get is a system which certainly knows language. And if you look at you know, GPT-3, one example, you know, we see much more impressive natural language generation capabilities than I think we've seen recently. And I think a lot of cynics in the community were actually really quite impressed when they saw what was going on and had to sort of recalibrate their views about what, what was going on. But I think also attached to that and somehow intrinsically tied to it, these models have knowledge about the world uh, in uh, a potentially very useful way. And the, to realize the potential, I think, means not just, ju not just using these as, as language generation tools, but actually, you know, they've got a body of knowledge about the world, which is somehow quite closely tied to that knowledge of language. And I'm curious whether you can actually separate those things in a, really in a meaningful sense. So for me, that's, that's the, the exciting thing, that, that knowledge which is, which is there, you know, you've thrown the entirety of the World Wide Web at it, how can you then leverage that. I think that's really quite an interesting possibility. Yeah, sort of know what, I guess. Exciting. Yeah. Um, why don't we bring up some of the, the I'm I don't know if you can put it on the screen, but I'm going to have a little look at the results of this poll. Mm, interesting. So um, we had, are you excited by the possibilities of foundation models or do you think there'll be a flash in the pan? The options were, I'm so excited I haven't sat down since last summer, meh, and let's wait and see. And we have, have the vast majority of the votes are for let's wait and see. Um, so it sounds like there's a bit of a tentative audience, perhaps maybe sort of reflected in the panel. Um, there is a lot of people though that are so excited they haven't sat down since last summer. So um, <laughs> feel free to take a seat now that we know you're uh, know how you're feeling. Um, so let's kind of move on to a little bit. You mentioned about scale, and we were talking we were talking about this yesterday about what it means to um, sort of get past the hype around AI and what, what's the sort of reality of what's going on and the scaling of, of AI was something that we spoke about quite a lot. Now, contemporary foundation models involve billions of parameters. How far do we all think that foundation models will be able to scale? Will ever larger models deliver better AI or is something else kind of needed in order to get what it is that we're looking for? I'm going to go to you first this time, Phil. Um, I don't think it's a linear scaling it's not like we make them bigger and bigger and they get better and better uh, and I think we're currently we've, we've been through the let's make them bigger phase and now there's there's a lot of people interested in can we get the same performance as GPT-3 with a with an order of magnitude less uh, order of magnitude fewer parameters and if you see what people are doing at the moment there's a lot of interest in that because we know we can the the first thing we try 
uh, with these big models is always very rough. We haven't tuned them properly, and we know as we tune them properly, we can do just as well uh, with much, much uh, uh, fewer parameters. Uh, there's also more than one dimension. It's not just all about parameters. Uh, the other dimension is data, especially in language models. That uh, is one of the core of the sort of foundation model ideas. Traditionally, we thought much more in terms of data. How much data has the model seen? Like Mike was saying, how much of the web has it has it seen? How much knowledge can it actually have, have um, uh, brought into the model versus the parameters? And that trade-off is a big question that people are exploring. Um, so there's a number of dimensions. We'll explore all of them. Thing, they will get bigger because everything gets bigger. In terms of computation, my phone uses much more computation than, than the previous models before that. So we'll keep going in that, in that sort of bigger, more computation. But whether it's parameters or data um, or other sort of, there's, there's a lot of interest in what are called semi-parametric models, retrieval models. So it's, a, it's an interesting space. Amazing. Um, I'm going to bring you in, Angelica, on the same question as well. What are you sort of, what are your thoughts in terms of how we actually get these models to both grow in terms of usefulness, but how much they actually grow in terms of computation at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, I feel like what some of the thoughts here, I mean, it is indeed like a bit of a pendulum where we had small models, but clean data, then we get, we went to like huge models kitchen sink data and we will stabilize probably somewhere um, not quite in the middle, but we will stabilize at the somewhat, you know, clean data and for potentially smaller models. Um, but also, uh, with, yeah, with respect to the to the second part of the question, uh, I mean, th there are some problems that just scale on its own, you know, cannot solve and like the uh, it, the simplest problem is, for example, when we talk about keeping models up to date, uh, it's a, it, no matter how big a model is, it like, will it be a fortune teller? I mean, probably not. And this is, for example, the type of, of, of problems that um, the retrieval based models that, that Phil mentioned make, makes it possible um, to tackle. So. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess I hope that uh, scaling is just like the brute force way to do something and slowly we will start thinking about, let's say, the better inductive biases that we will need to put in the model to outsource some of uh, those particular needs. And kind of building on this point you were saying there about, you know, kitchen uh, sink data versus small amounts. I mean, what does that mean in terms of choice choices being made around data in order, to, you know, to train these models or to build these models? I mean, obviously, when we're talking about these narrow but deep, you're going to use really specific data specific to the thing you ultimately want the model to be able to do. But if the idea here is to be broad, I mean, you said knowledge about the world, but I mean, how do you even choose what we what do we define as knowledge about the world in the first place and therefore make choices around data? How do we think about that with foundation models? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really important question and, and sort of to slightly take issue with uh, something that Mike said, if you train something on Wikipedia, it doesn't get knowledge of the world, it gets knowledge of Wikipedia, which hopefully reflects knowledge of the world. Uh, and somebody, I, I read somewhere that models like GPT-3 are called bullshit machines in a very precise sense. So there is somebody, a sociologist, who I forget the definition, but has a precise definition of bullshit. And it basically means it doesn't care about truth or not. Mm. So oh, this is Carl Bergstrom's book recently. Right, yes. yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the one. And I, I, that resonated with me because, you know, you train it on Wikipedia, okay, you get what the typical Wikipedia article looks like. You train it on Reddit, you get what mm. a typical Reddit article, and I've seen some pretty nasty examples of what you get when yeah. you then uh, put a prompt in there or an, or an image. And so then, so I think another question of scale is also one model or many models, because, you know, if you have Wikipedia as one distribution, let's say in language, and Reddit as another distribution, well, it's hard to deal with multimodal data. You know, you, you really need a very clever density estimator. If the density estimator is not so clever, you're going to average Wikipedia and Reddit and you get something that is, that is meaningless. So mm. I think it's a really important but difficult question in AI, whether you go the way of specialized models mm. or whether you just throw more data at it and the, with the danger that things are averaging out and mm. you actually don't get good performance. And what's your kind of thought on this this point as well, Mike? I mean, I'm, I'm also thinking about, 
you know, one of the questions I've always been kind of intrigued around data choice with AI models is do you pick data that sort of is the world you'd like to see or do you pick the world that we currently have, which we're meant to be trying to improve with these AI models in the first I think place? Peter's absolutely right to point out that, uh, you know, undis- throwing undiscriminated data at this thing, is it can lead to some pretty horrible results. And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I say the point that I was trying to make is that... Uh, that, that, that there is some knowledge latent within those models we, and the challenge is to leverage that knowledge and I think we don't quite know how to do that yet. Um, uh, and so I, going forward, I think one big challenge is being able to train very large models in a kind of in a responsible way where we really know what we're doing rather than just throwing Reddit. Actually, it's a slightly scary prospect <laughs> that somebody threw Reddit at these things. Um, just to go back to the issue of scale, I think Phil's analysis is absolutely right, and that there is something. There has been something of a kind of arms race in the sense that you know just throw more compute resources. You know, company X throws one data center at this, so company Y throws two, and exactly as Phil says, you do not get a linear scaling of intelligence coming out. And so the next challenge, I believe, exactly as Phil says, is to, how can we do this more efficiently? And as we were discussing yesterday, you know, the brain is a rather modest consumer of, of power compared to uh, pretty much anything that's, uh, that's trained in ML these days. And, we, and what that demonstrates, we've got a long way to go before we're, before we're doing things remotely as efficiently as, as, as in principle it's possible to do. So that, that actually brings us on really nicely onto our next question. Um, we've talked a little bit about responsible building, um, but there's another you know, big criticism of these large models with regard to the compute resources that they require. Um, thinking about you know, energy usage, so many different things that come into this. Should we be concerned about this? You know, how can we make technology more sustainable? Before we go, I'm going to go to you, Angelica, first. But before we do that, I'm going to go to the audience because we've got um, another poll question for you. And it's the same question. Are you concerned about using ever large compute and data resources to train foundation models? Let us know what you think and we'll, we'll come and see whatever in the audience, uh, how you're feeling about this important topic. Um, but Angelica, let's, let's hear your thoughts first. On the how to make them more sustainable? Uh, or tell us first if you're concerned. Do you feel concerned? I mean, I, yeah, yeah, like, like everyone, everyone concerned clearly with the scale. Uh, I mean, to the degree that sometimes, you know, you can't easily work with the big models, you know, if it takes time, you know, to take, uh, to, to do inference, for example. Um, it, uh, but, yeah, and it's also like concerning, you know, with respect to like, because if we want to think, for example, in this future where these models are democratized and like everyone is using them and everyone is building them, I mean, clearly the scale currently becomes uh, prohibited unless, for example, like the big science project led by Hiking Face and like a number of um, other individuals as another way to, to democratize models. But um, so how can we how can we better work with them well we will have to find i guess ways to make them smaller um also like i mean we it's a lot of things that we don't currently um understand about the training of of big models because it's something you know that happened probably you know like a year or two years ago so it, it, we are still quite early on finding the optimal ways that we can be training those models so uh i'm hopeful that there will be uh the more that we understand about the learning dynamics the more we will be able for example to train them more if, even on that size for example even more efficiently um yeah but other than that i mean we'll have to think about make them smaller in some way Make them smaller and wait for the science to make them more efficient, is what, is what Angelic is saying. Um, where, where do you land on this, Phil? Um, like in terms of concern, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily concerned directly about the scale. Maybe I'm contrarian on this. Uh, I think the, the main thing is if we're, if we're putting resources into these big models, we want them to actually be useful. So if, if they're not, that's not worth burning lots of, uh, of energy on. Um, uh, but the idea of foundation models um, in and of itself is actually a good one from a, from a resource point of view because the idea is rather than every company, every researcher building their own model, 
uh, we can build a small number of models and all share them. And so we, we amortize the, the, the cost of computation. Um, of course, the question is who builds them? <laughs> that's a key question. But that's the idea. That this, so, but at the moment, we're very much in the research phase um, where everyone's thinking of training these models. But in most of machine learning in, in industry, it's not about training, it's about deployment. Um, so we train the models, hopefully, once uh, or a few times, get the model, and then we deploy it. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the usage and energy is, if you think about all the people using the, the Google homepage right now. It's, there's a whole lot of machine learning models that are trained, but that day-to-day -day upkeep of keeping all those uh, uh, users happy is where the real energy cost is. Uh, so that the, the idea of foundational models is um, uh, a nice one in some sense from the energy point of view. The moment most of this discussion is, is researchers talking about training models, wanting to train their own. Um, there's very few people that have actually got their hands dirty trying to deploy a model like this, and that's one of the, that we're in the stage where almost no one has actually deployed these models. That will change, um, and the discussion will change a lot around all of these questions. Amazing. Um, Peter or Mike, do you want to come in on this question as well? Anything to add? Well, <clears throat> I agree with Phil. If, if, if we get it right then, and we separate the training from the deployment, then the training is where a lot of the energy goes. Um, but I, I am worried about it because, you know, stepping outside of foundation models for a moment, people doing deep learning, it's not visible how much energy you, we use to do yet another cross-validation experiment. And, and it's not built into our methodology, and it has to be. It has to be made more visible, I think, what, what we burn through when we use our university supercomputer. Do we really need another experiment? You know, sh or should we be a bit more careful with designing our experiments mm. so that we do a bit, bit less trial and error? I yeah. think that's also kind of uh, a, a natural development that we just that we got used to so yeah. I think it's really important that we make this visible in in whatever manifestations of AI of machine learning yeah I, I think your your point about making it visible and making it part of the methodology and making it something that's just a normal part of discussion is really key I was speaking at the public sector data summit up in Scotland um, the other week and you know the it sort of trying to encourage all the councils are in Scotland to you know employ a lot more data and, and data methodologies and that was one of the big questions it was like what does it mean for every council in Scotland to suddenly be utilizing things and particularly when we start thinking about ever more bigger models are we even is this question even at the forefront um, mm. hopefully today I was talking about it as a start anything to add um, to that as well Mike? yeah so I'm concerned about it yes and no I think the distinction that we've heard about between, you know, the effort that's required to train a model, which with these models is, is substantial, versus the, the, the energy that's required to actually run them. Once you've done the training, you know, running these models is, 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 is not a particular issue. Um, so I'm, and I, that's a nicely explained way, I think, of, of, of putting it. Um, I guess my concern is about throwing big compute resources at things is lazy science and as a scientist I find that kind of unsatisfying um, and so that I would like to see and, and many people are I mean these are not invisible problems there are tons of people thinking about these issues and there are many different ways of tackling it I mean I think you know one you know the, the fund one one point that's made quite often is that if if so much power is required to train these things so much compute resource then there is something not right about the very fundamental algorithms that we use for doing these trainings. You know, there is an issue with gradient descent if 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 it, if it consumes this much if it consumes this much resource. Um, but there are you know there are other ways of tackling these problems and modularity and structure rather than just having kind of somewhat large monolithic models, having modular models where you can uh, uh, and, and thinking about the, the the structure of these systems a little bit more with more specialist training for components rather than trying to do very very broad brush training is is another way forward. So we're talking about these things. I say that you know these issues are out there in the community and many people are thinking about them. I think. Yeah, and actually reflecting on the, the poll here, <laughs> um, so there was there was three options for the answer. We had not concerned, let's throw another GPU at it. Concerned, but probably the worries are overstated. And concerned, but it's necessary means to a reasonable end. And in reverse order, that was the results. The means to an end was the top vote. Most people feel concerned, but it's necessary means to an end. In the middle was worries are overstated. And at the bottom, we've got a few people going, let's just throw another GPU at it because they're not concerned at all. So, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting that there's clearly discussion here, but it sounds like there's still more to be um, 
well, not just more to be discussed, more to be found, because it hasn't been done yet, as you kind of pointed out, um, and kind of it's clearly a conversation that's not complete. Um, we haven't actually talked to applications, so let's have a little discussion about what, what do we actually think we're going to be able to see out of this, all things going well. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about what potential might be, but in, in the real world, what do you think we might be able to actually get out of utilising some of these models? We'll start with you this time, Peter. Um, I think the strongest application at the moment are, I think, with language and sort of question answering. Uh, you know, and uh, bots and things like that, which then opens the door also to fake news <laughs> and all the rest of it. Um, I, I on the train coming here, I, I looked again at the Stanford report, which 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 launched the term foundation models, and they they singled out three areas, which I think was healthcare, law, and education. It struck me that there was quite a lot of wishful thinking in there where they said, okay, well, if once we have a model of how students think, then we can do X, Y, Z. And you think, hang on a moment, how do we, that, that's, that's hard, right? I mean, as, as an educator myself, one of the hardest things is to answer questions of a student who misunderstands something because you suddenly need to think on your feet and how did they misunderstand it and how can I address that? So. Um, I think we need to be a bit careful there and, and not yet again feed the hype cycle of AI and have a lot of wishful thinking. When I was, uh, I stepped down a year ago, but when I was editor in chief of the machine learning journal and COVID hit, I suddenly got all these papers submitted to me. Yeah, we have sort of predictions of COVID in country XYZ, and you think. I mean, what are these people thinking? I talked to epidemiologists. Epidemiology is hard. Do you just really think that you can throw some data at it and just solve epidemiology? And, and I think we, we really need to be careful that we work with the domain experts and not try to sort of go over them and just say, well, how hard can it be? Just take some electronic health records and mm. sort of, you know, so um, I'm, I'm not saying that that was really what was in the Stanford report, no. but I think the devil is in the detail there. And each application, that's what I learned, that for each application area, there's a huge learning curve and a huge investment on both sides to make sure you speak you speak the same yeah. language. You would hope so. after all this, all these different peaks and troughs of hype cycles in AI we might have, might have learned, but I guess there's still a little bit there to go. Um, Angelica, let's go to you in terms of what sort of applications you perhaps foresee or are excited about or think are perhaps realistic uh, building um, on top of Peter's point. So I'm going to talk about something that I think it's realistic even today and something that I find very exciting. Um, so the realistic has to do with augmenting human intelligence and um, and augmenting human intelligence, like you don't need to be potentially, you know, like the real AI, right? For example, we have cal calculators today that I would argue that, you know, they do a pretty good job at augmenting our intelligence, um, but they're not themselves like very intelligent. Now, the, the foundation models, they're like, you know, much more, let's say, capable than, than just simple calculators. Um, so we can really think um, about a lot of applications where uh, we use foundation models to detect patterns, to summarize patterns, to cluster patterns for, for users in some way. And then we let the decision making, for example, on the user, because we don't feel that foundation models, for example, today are, you know, they have the right degree of, of reasoning, or uh, we don't even trust them as in the healthcare example before, but they can already do a lot of preparatory work for the user to come in and, and give, um, the, let's say, the final touch. And then a lot of work there with, um, you know, uh, doing good work with inter interfacing that with human computer interaction work, so HCI work, to make it more accessible um, to more users. And something that I'm, I'm very excited about, but we are probably not there as of yet, is uh, is really making um, making these models programmable in natural language. And we have already seen. Um, some of this coming I also saw something um, on the Twitter on Twitter or over the weekend where a user used a uh, natural language to design like a simple a simple game um, and I find this idea of like using not you know communicating to communicating to a machine in natural language so that the machine can create something that might 
uh, require some generalist, so, sorry, some specialist knowledge like coding. Um, extremely exciting because it opens up opportunities, for example, for many people that might have the, the, the passion, but they might be missing the skill, for example. But we are not there yet. We, we started seeing things yet there, but we need a lot more work to make this dream really realizable. Um, we've got quite a few um, questions from the audience. Is there anything either of you want to add on the applications before I, I dive in? Yeah, I guess there's one thing I want to say. I mean, I think Angelique is absolutely right in her, the way that uh, she describes, you know, when, when you've got applications where you've got abundant data, you know, these, these are, these are this, this is an obvious target for these, these, these kinds of systems. And, you know, in drug discovery, uh, you know, there ten, for example, there tends to be lots of data around. But let me give you an example, just one area where I'm a little bit concerned. So there, there, there is a system, I believe it's called Copilot, uh, which is now available on GitHub. And, you know, as I understand, you know, roughly Copilot was trained by throwing all the public code on GitHub at this. And the idea is you can type in a, kind of a natural language description of a piece of code that you want, and it will, it will, it will produce such code. Um, you don't have to look very hard to find examples where it just doesn't work. And what worries me is that, um, you know, human beings are lazy and naive and trusting, and it would be very easy to, you know, for people to start inserting such code into, you know, the, the, the systems that they're building. I find that very, very worrying. So, I mean, I think what you get out of these models is something potentially interesting, but not necessarily something you can take absolutely at face value. You know, you need to do some work to be sure that this is, to, this is the thing that you really, really want. Um, I think, uh, I think, uh, as, as, as Peter said, I think uh, you know, natural language generation is is the most obvious area there. Um, although there are lots of pitfalls awaiting naive use of the technology in those kind of areas. Just in the last couple of days, I saw one of my students pointed me at some really nice work with using these models to help you query the web. So you don't know exactly what you're looking for on the web, so you can type in what you're looking for, and it will use this embodied knowledge, this latent knowledge to help you refine those queries and get a better query on the web and help you target very ingenious use of the technology. And I think we will see a lot more similar, very ingenious uses of it. But I say, you know, one can't take the outputs at face value. And I do worry that some people think that you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Let's, um, I'm going to go straight into questions from the audience because I don't want to um, hold off much longer. There's a few that have got quite a few votes. Um, first one from Anonymous, it's got the most votes. Do you think interpretability and explainability will be more difficult for foundation models as they're said to be so broad? Who wants to jump in on that one first? Do you want to go first, Phil? Um, sure. I mean, we, we, we need to in, uh, separate the instantiation of a particular foundation model from the, the actual model. At the moment, <clears throat> when we talk about foundation models, there are actually very few models that people are actually sort of putting in this category, and they're mostly big transformer models, whether they're trained on, on text or pixels in images or a combination of the two, that's mostly what people are talking about. Um, and transformers are not terribly interpretable. Uh, they're quite hard to interpret, um, especially if you've got tasks, downstream tasks that are very separate from the way they were trained. It's very hard to see how downstream behaviour corresponds to some particular uh, training. Often the, 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 the loss and everything else is quite different. Um, that said, we, we, can, we can separate the two. So it's perfectly reasonable to think that there might be um, future proposals for models which are much more interpretable or transformers themselves might evolve in a more interpretable way. Um, so yes, at the moment where we're at is we're much more interested in, in behaviour rather than interpretation. We're, we're interested in getting good performance. Um, uh, but that could easily evolve. Okay. Anyone want to add anything else on this point? Yeah, well... Often the term black box is, 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 is used here, and I think, you know, there's nothing against black boxes. I'm looking at two black boxes right now. I have no idea what actually goes in, on inside your head, but I, you know, I, I generalize my own, own knowledge. So I think when I trust my GP, I don't necessarily do that because I fully understand what they're saying, but I trust the whole system that produced this GP, and that comes back to some point that you made. We need some safeguarding around mm -hmm. are these models produced in the right way with the right kind of data we probably need an MOT for these models that they are regularly kind of inspected and are they yeah. still fit for purpose once you have those safeguards in place then 
in some cases, you, you would be happy with using a black box. But in other cases, you do want to inspect the model. And people like Cynthia Rudin uh, have made very powerful arguments. But if, if explainability and interpretability is very important for you, you probably don't want to use those kind mm. of models mm. and then fix it afterwards. You probably want to use a kind of a method where interpretability is, is there from Central. the start. Mm -hmm. Let's, um, let's, I, know, I know probably all of you can feed into this, but we want, I want to get through as many of these audience questions. Another one um, from Adrian Powell has got the most votes at the moment. Does the panel have any opinions on how we might achieve real NLU and reasoning using NNs? Who wants to jump in on that one? You laughed, so I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, well, if I knew how to do it, I, I would have done it. Um, if, when we talk about real NLU, they mean, uh, you mean natural language understanding um, with, with neural networks. Um, we're not there, uh, and there's some pretty big gaps that we don't really know how to jump at this point. Um, we're getting better and better at processing language, and uh, we can do amazing things with that, as you see if you go to Google and try and translate things or search for things. Or you, can do a, you can do a lot without understanding language. Um, uh, whether, so neural networks are a broad area. Whatever we come to will probably be, you can characterise as a neural network in, in some way, but it will probably look quite different to what we're doing today. Um, but there, we're definitely not on a on a linear slope that we're climbing. There's some big uh, sort of gaps that we have to solve along the way. Um, so that's the, they're the interesting and hard problems. Yeah, no. So I think this sort of my answer I think relates also to the to the previous point about explainability. So. Um, Suppose you, you, you give some task to GPT-3, you know, you prompt it with a few sentences and it comes back with, let's say, it makes some recommendation about how you fix the economy or something like that. And you then ask it to explain. So GPT-3 is, uh, I say, people had to kind of recalibrate their expectations a little bit when they saw the kind of outputs that it was producing. It's a, you know, at first blush, they look very, very plausible and so on. But there's no understanding. There's no meaning there. These are just things that are being produced because, you know, the system is designed to produce, you know, the likeliest sounding outputs. So I do wonder whether we're happy to accept meaningless statements that just look meaningless uh, or, or whether we really demand something else um, in the same way that we would of, of a human being. And that's a bit of a puzzle for me and I don't know what the answer is there. Um, but I think that's, we're not, I think Phil's and, uh, you know, Phil and Peter are the real, Phil, Peter and Angelique are much more grounded in this than I am. Uh, but it's, it's obvious that we've still got a long way to go yet, I think is the answer to that question. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next. Oh, sorry, Angelique, on you go. I mean, I just want to throw one sentence, which is like these are all true, but at the same time, um, if you, if we want to have true NLU, maybe you know we should also be thinking about better evaluations, harder evaluations, you know, better data sets, because usually these come hand in hand. So, yeah, let's not just blame the models, you know, let's just also blame occasionally our our own uh, our own evaluations for that. Awesome addition. Um, let's go to the next question then. We've got another one um, quite popular from Mike Wald. Traditional statistical analysis has confidence levels and error bars, etc. Can such concepts be used for large um, AI neural, natural, neural network models? Um, Peter. I think it's very important. Um, I've been working myself a lot in sort of getting calibrated probabilities out of out of machine learning models in the same way as, uh, as a weather forecaster when they say 70% chance of rain, that is not the subjective probability that the Bayesians are so fond of, that actually means something in terms of relative frequencies in the world. And, and there's lots of reasons why you want those calibrated probabilities, uh, because it, it, it leads to optimal decision making and you can, you can make decisions based on costs and so on. So I think, uh, I don't know enough about the technology to know where, where the state of the art is, but we definitely want that. One one way in which you can get confidence is, is of course, by using ensembles of models and sort of, you know, getting some kind of average prediction and then you can also see the variance in the prediction. So definitely important. Okay, I'm going to ask um, another one just quickly from the from the audience before we start to wrap up, kind of linked to some of the other questions you've had here. Does using large proprietary models disable being able to quantify and estimate the uncertainty and biases on output, it was mentioned earlier about proprietary models, I'm not sure who it was that said it, but if you want to 
elaborate on that a little bit for the anonymous asker <laughs> in the audience? Mike, we'll go to you for this one. Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, it, it, it relates to the, to, the, to the previous question very well. And I would say, I mean, I, I, emphasizing again that I'm the... The, 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 the least expert on this panel in, 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 this, in this area, but I would certainly say at the moment, no, there's no chance of having a statistical confidence, which is underlining my, my point that I made earlier, that one can't take answers that are produced by these systems at face value. You need to be able to check. You need to be able to verify what's going on. They may be, they may, I would think about them more like heuristics, the solutions that are, you know, you, you, they're, they're rules of thumb and that's all. They can, they can be wrong and they can, it doesn't stop them being useful but taking them as uh, taking them at, at face value, I think, can be very, very dangerous. I think um, I don't want to say dangerous is a good way to end on, but I think <laughs> your point around um, taking them at face value and understanding potential, but also pitfalls, I think, is probably I would say a nice summary of what we've been discussing here in the panel. Um, awesome to dive into this new hypey but very intriguing and interesting term, and hopefully um, has been really helpful for everyone in the audience to get a little bit more um, insight into foundation models. So thank you all, um, and Angelique as well, online for joining us here today to talk all things foundation models. Um, we have now come to the end of all of the content on the In the Lab stage for AI UK 2022. I can't believe it's been two full days of content already that um, has flown by. So thank you very much for, for joining us either for this session or any of the other sessions on this stage. We're now going to head over to the conversation stage for our final wrap-up session. I'm going to be running across the corridor to, um, to get there on time um, to, to wrap up the whole of AI UK, hopefully you've, you've dropped in and out of all the different stages and got lots of different um, brilliant ideas and content about all of what's happening in AI and data science in the UK community and beyond. So uh, without further ado, we'll close up on this stage and we'll see you over on the conversation stage in just a couple of minutes time. Thank you very much.